to come in, God. I heard, I heard the prayer warrior said that somebody had a funeral on yesterday, but it wasn't our funeral, God. God, so we thank you, Lord, for, the, for life on today, God. God, for life, God, for the activities of our limbs, oh God. God, there's somebody, God, right now, God, that's not able to put their limbs on today, God. God, but we're grateful, oh God. Oh God, some of us, God, walked in on this morning, God. Oh God, after a long try, God. Oh God, but you allowed us to make it to your house safely, oh God. God, we thank you, oh God. God, we know it's a holiday weekend. And God, we can be anywhere else, God, but we're in your sanctuary, God. God, we're in your house, oh God. And God, you allowed us, God, to be here. And God, we thank you, oh God. Now, God, have your way in the service. God, for you are El Shaddai. You are the almighty God. You are the all-knowing God. Oh God, begin to move, God. Begin to let the atmosphere, God, be set, God. Oh God, to be a receptive, oh God, atmosphere, God, so that we may receive, God, from you on the day. God, be I'll be sharing a little bit more in the word. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Many of us, we know, we hear the familiar stories about some of the familiar characters of the Bible. And in this particular uh, lesson on today, we're going to be talking about Paul. And Paul is a very familiar character in the Bible. Most people, even if they're not saved, has heard, have heard about the apostle Paul. Paul. Amen. Glory to God. Paul, uh, we know, was uh, persecuting 
uh, the, the Christian Jews and God knocked him off his horse and he had an encounter, he had an experience with Christ. Amen. He had an experience with the Lord. Amen. And so uh, from that experience, uh, uh, he got up from that. Amen. Glory to God. And he got up and he began to purposely move for the Lord. He began to get busy. Amen. Somebody say he got busy. And so as we come into the 21st uh, uh, book or the 21st uh, chapter of the book of Acts, amen, we're going to see a story that many of us may not be familiar with. And uh, I, I, as I was, we were going through, we have Sunday school sometimes during the week at home, amen. And so the Sunday school lesson about two weeks ago was talking about the Apostle Paul. And the lesson was about his, his, his time and his experience on the island of Malta. And y'all know if you're not familiar with the story, Paul was shipwrecked and he told everybody to stay with the ship. And if you stay with the ship, all the lives will be saved. And so the island that they were able to float or get to, the wreckage was going towards, was Malta. Amen. And so uh, as they landed on Malta, we know that there was already a native people that lived on the island, but they were friendly. And so they befriended them and they, they, they started a fire. And many of you know the story. A serpent jumped on Paul's hand. Amen. Latched strong to his hand. And, and the people begin to say, he escaped the sea. Surely he's guilty because now this serpent, he didn't get away. The serpent done bit him and the islanders knew that this particular uh, species was deadly. But somebody said he shook it off into the fire. Shook it off into the fire. And so as we were studying that, amen, uh, uh, Dr. Mom, amen, she began to say, you know, in the 21st chapter, you know, he was warned. And I said, you know what? I, don't, I know I've read, I've, I've even took an, I've taken a class on, on the book of Acts and I don't re recall that. So I didn't say anything at the time, but she came up on me uh, one morning. I was sitting in the, in the family room and I said, I said, I found that passage of scripture and that's what we're going to look at today. Because sometimes we skip over uh, some important text because we like to hear about him, Paul and Silas. And right. We like to hear about the shipwreck, but it's important to hear what we're going to hear on today. And I said, you know, I said, not only was he uh, uh, prophesied to and warned about what was going uh, to possibly take place, and uh, uh, the people were, were sharing with him, but um, I, uh, we're going to see. Let me, I'm not trying to get ahead of myself. We're going to see, because this is, this, I'm just setting the teaser, amen? So I'm going to give you a portion, but we're going to look back at the scripture as we go through the word on today. And so Acts 21, I'm going to start, I'm going to read 10 through 12 for you this morning. Amen. So several days, 10th verse, several days later, a man named Agabus, who also had the gift of prophecy, arrived from Judea. He came over, took Paul's belt, and bound his own feet and his hands with them. Then he said, the Holy Spirit declares, so shall the owner of this belt be bound by the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem and turned over to the Gentiles. When we heard this, now this is Luke writing, he writes the book of Acts, amen. He's one of Paul's uh, disciples, which is also a disciple of Christ, but he's, uh, he's one of Paul's friends. He says, when we heard this, we and the local believers all begged Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Have you ever had a strong conviction by the Holy Spirit to do something? You, you, the Holy Spirit has spoke and you know that what God is asking you or saying that where you need to go uh, he's telling you you need to go down to Skid Row. And, and I, God is saying, I need you to go down there because my people 
They're hungry, not just for bread, but for the word. And I need someone to go down. I know it's an area where many people don't want to go. I know it's an area that smells foul. I know there's some thieves down there. I know there's some drug addicts down there. But I got an assignment for you. And so there was this strong conviction that God is saying, I need you to go. Whatever it is that God has said in your life, God has said, I, I, I'm putting this strong, this strong feeling down in you that you know it's me. And I'm telling you to go. And the minute you share, people know that you're getting ready to go and, and do the Lord's work. They start telling you, Girl, I wouldn't go down there. You know, I, I you know, I, 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 you know, I. The Lord showed me that there's trouble down there. What do you do? Someone else comes and says, "Hey, girl, you know, I know, I know. You said that you are, you are intending to go. You're determined to go down and do what God has called you to do. But I, the Lord showed me." That if you go, you're going to be put in chains. What do you do? This is where we find Paul this morning. A few years ago, about 2017, because that was the year Jaron left for college, uh, I shared a message titled, Had To. And I don't expect y'all to, okay. to remember it, but it was good. Amen. Had To. And to refresh your memories, I want to just share a little, amen. Had To is a motivational message company dedicated to helping youth and young adults build personal and professional life skills with a had to attitude to achieve their goals. Through their organization, they collaborate with businesses, policymakers, educators, students, and parents to develop a push for new ideals that will lead to real improvements. The goal is not to manage innovation, but to become innovative. Come on, somebody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We like to manage stuff. I'm a, I like to manage sometimes, but sometimes we just need to push for something new. The, ta the challenge had to hopes uh, the challenge that they had is had to hopes to install instill a message that we strive to believe best the best versions of ourselves not for glory or fame or wealth but because we had to can you imagine doing something and some of us do but some of us, we do it because we look for glory, we look for fame, and we look for how much we're going to get paid. But if we started doing what God called us to do, not because we had to be up on the platform, not because we had to be on the camera, but because we had to. The founder of Had To, Ron Watson, created the Had To Graduate and had to stop the violence initiative because the statistics were sad and startling. Kids weren't graduating, starting college but not finishing. Kids were, um, kids were uh, getting into places of business but not being able to finish, amen. So they started this so that the students uh, would would know that there was someone behind them pushing them uh, to go through. And then they, they had to, to stop the violence because a lot of our young people, believe it or not, are our victims uh, to domestic violence. They're, vi they're victims to bullying. Amen. So, and that's not my message on today, but I just want you to understand the had to movement. So every once in a while, God finds a man or a woman uh, who is unwilling to be like everyone else because they had to. God finds a person who has the courage to stand up and stand out because they had to. God finds an Abraham, an Elijah, a David, a Daniel, a Deborah, a Hannah, a Ruth, a Mary. Too many are satisfied to be like other well-known Christians. I was meeting with someone and I told, I was 
was saying to her, um, she already was understanding the concept that um, I used to be told why reinvent the wheel. And then I heard a speaker, a phenomenal speaker said, you know what, yes, we've been using that wheel so long, somebody needs to break it and do something new. Come on, somebody. That's why right now we got we got some hover hoverboards. And right now they're testing out cars that, that hover and they don't use the traditional means of, of way of, of getting from point A to point B. Why? Because of innovation. So sometimes we're satisfied to be like others. Sometimes we're satisfied to worship as usual. Uh, too many are satisfied to come in dirty and leave the same way. Uh, we, we, too many are unwilling uh, 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 to be or too, too afraid to step out and cut a new path. I hope on today, after hearing this word, that you say, I am the path cutter. I am the one that's getting ready to go a different way. God has called me and God has, is going to use me and I'm going to go an untraditional route. But is there anyone that here that says that you've had a how-to, a had-to experience? Not because you decided to do it, but because God called you. So you had to be the motivator. You had to be the collaborator. Uh -huh. You had to be the educator. You had to be the initiator. You had to be the peacemaker. You had to be the mama when there was no mama. You had to be the daddy when there was no daddy. You had to be the one to say after church, after the program, after the party, after everybody left to clean up the house. You had to be the one to lay out all night praying for someone else's breakthrough. Because you had to. What about having to go knowing that you would face imprisonment, hardship, suffering, and death? Would you still go? Would you still say, Lord, I hear you? And I'm not going to change my course, but I'm going to go in spite of the hardship, in spite of the suffering. See, we don't understand a lot of times, we love to quote, uh, Paul says that he knew how to be a base, and he knew how to be a ground. But see, what a lot of people, we love to quote, oh, I know how to be a base, but we have never been in a prison situation. Come on, somebody. A lot of us like to say that, but we don't know what it means to go without a meal. We don't know what it means to suffer for Christ. We've never been spit on in our face because we're out there witnessing and telling people that Jesus is the only way. Come on, somebody. We, 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 we. Some of us haven't experienced uh, your name being defamed and your name being slandered because of Christ. So would you still go if you knew that your name would be put down even though you know that that's not who you are? Would you go knowing that uh, if I go and I stand out here that I might be imprisoned and ultimately face death? Paul is warned not to go to Jerusalem but he is bound and determined to trust God and go. Even if it cost him dearly. Because he had to. So two questions as we begin this morning. I want you to keep these in your mind. Write them down if you have a pen and pencil. Because you need to come back and ask your own self. Two questions this morning. How 
Do you know you are really trusting God? We say, I trust you, Lord. I'm leaning on, depending on Jesus. How do you know you are really trusting God? Number two, what do you do when the will of God involves doing something that will really cost you? What do you do when the will of God involves doing something that is really going to cost you? So this morning, I, I want to take as a, a subject have to trust God and go. Have. Present tense. I have to trust God and go. I have to. So let's go to the scripture one more time. We're going to go back and read starting at verse 1. And the scripture says this. It says, after saying farewell to the Ephesian elders, we sail straight to the island of Kos. The next day we reached Rhodes and we went to uh, Pun Punatara. There we boarded a ship sailing for Phoenicia. We, we sighted an island of Cyprus, passed it on the left, and landed at the harbor of Tyre in Syria, where the ship was to unload its cargo. So we see Paul, we see he's on a journey. And Luke is, is the scribe here that's writing Paul's story. And not only is he writing Paul's story, he, he writes the book of Acts, amen, as we go into the church age. And he tells us that they board a boat and they they go and they're heading uh, uh, they're heading to Jerusalem. And so we see that this is the last leg of Paul's journey. This is getting ready to be the end. And so uh, Paul leaves Jerusalem. I mean, he leaves for Jerusalem. Uh, and he's on his journey. And so as he leaves, the Bible says that he was in Ephesus. And so the Ephesian believers, uh, the elders are bidding him by. And, and the Bible says that, uh, uh, that, that he, it, was, he was, it was hard for him to say farewell. And the New International Version gives a more colorful description of their parting uh, it says that, that we, we had to tear ourselves away wow. from each other. Wow. Imagine Paul, the Spirit of God has already spoken to Paul. Paul knows that he has to go to Jerusalem. Paul uh, has to go, amen, uh, to take care of some business. Uh, but, but God is saying to him, you, you, this is your course. I'm calling you to this place because I got some things that I need you to do. And there's some things that will not be accomplished if you don't go to Jerusalem. And so he tears himself away, uh, knowing that he's headed to a place where people don't want him. Paul is a convert. As I shared, he was persecuting the Jews. And so he still has a reputation that's following him. Have you ever had your reputation follow you? Everybody sees you up in the pulpit. Uh, people see uh, that you have changed your life. You don't curse no more. You don't drink no more. You're not self-righteous. You're not puffed up no more. But everybody, some people, want to remember when. And in Jerusalem, there were those who remembered when. And so uh, Paul, he, he, 
and he's not going to see them again. What do you do when God is calling you and you're going in spite of knowing the danger because you might not see your friends again? The scripture goes on to read in verse 4 through 6 says this. It says, we went ashore and found the local believers. So now they, they have landed. Now they're looking for someone to stay with. It says, we went ashore and found the local believers, believers and stayed with them a week. These believers prophesied through the Holy Spirit that Paul should not go to Jerusalem. Number five, when we returned to the ship at the end of the week, the entire congregation, including women and children, left the city and came down to the shore with us. They, they, there we knelt and prayed and, and said our farewells. Then we went aboard and they returned home. Paul had no previous contact with this group that he is right now with in Tyre. Uh, but the Bible says that they are believers. He comes because he needs a place to stay. As you know, just like right now, uh, you can't get into the airports at the time. Uh, Paul's taking one ship, another ship, and, and, and possibly another ship to get to Jerusalem from where he was coming from. And so uh, he, had, he had some downtime. And so in the downtime, he goes and he finds these believers. And the scripture says that as he was there, the Holy Spirit, there were those there, the believers prophesied to him, don't go to Jerusalem. Don't, don't go to Jerusalem, Paul. What do you do when God is saying go and others are saying don't go? Go with God. Amen. Paul, he's staying with these believers and they pray. We see the scripture says how they came down and they, they followed him all the way down to where he was getting ready to depart. And they, 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 before they said their farewells, they prayed and then they went, they went back home. The scripture records that uh, the one significant interchange between Paul and the believers entire uh, involved them begging him through the spirit not to go. Don't go, Paul. We prayed and we see that there's going to be some problems. Don't go, Paul. How could the disciples entire be telling Paul one thing through the spirit when Paul says he was compelled by the Spirit of God to go. So good question. So when you think about the answer, and this is me thinking about the answer, the fact that the Holy Spirit showed the believers that there was going to be problems as Paul went, they said the Spirit of God was confirming and validating what he had already showed Paul. Paul knew that him going back to Jerusalem, that there probably could be some issues. But God said, I need you to go back to Jerusalem. And so God, being God, just like here, there might be uh, something going on and the, the Spirit of the Lord would begin to speak. And, 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 and the, the believers begin to, the God begin to show the believers that uh, if, when Paul goes to Jerusalem, it's not going to be good. They didn't know what was going to happen, but they knew that God was showing them Paul in bondage, Paul in chains. And so they begin to say, don't go. What do you do when God is saying, I need you to go? And other believers are saying, don't go. Don't go. Sometimes our family and our friends, they do hear from God. And God has showed them that, you know, uh, that there's going to be some trouble coming up. And because we love one another, we try to get, we try to shield one another. But God requires suffering sometimes. God recover, requires a, 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 a hardship sometimes. And even though we 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 sin, you know what, man? When they move, they gonna have to struggle. 
lady who the man reached into his car in the car and stabbed her. Amen. That happened a couple of years ago. And I started saying, no, 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 no. You're not, nah, put, your, put your hand back in. That was mama. Right. <laughs> but when God calls you and tells you to go, even if mama's saying that's dangerous, I don't want you out there uh, having to work with, uh, work around people that might hurt you. But when God calls you to work with a particular group, maybe God called you uh, to go out and sit with people who are coming down from being addicted to whether it's prescription, alcohol, or, or hard substances, whatever it is, God saying, uh, mama has nothing to do with it. Because when God says go, you got to go. And so, uh, we see now that God, he will guide us into situations um, that might cause us some pain and some suffering. I think, uh, and this is just Lisa, I think I'm very diligent with taking care of my bills. I, 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 I almost to a fault. I leave no room sometimes for me to have play or wiggle room. Right. Amen. Right. And I say, God, why do I have to suffer in this area when I know I'm doing everything right? Mm -hmm. But see, I also know that God has called me to be victorious. Yeah. And it's just like when you think about the, uh, the children of Israel, as they left out of Egypt, God could have taken them a short route. But God said, if I take you the short route, you haven't really learned how to be the fighter, the warrior that I called you to be. And if I take you the short route, you're going to have to go through some battles that you're not ready for. So God is saying, some of us are saying, well, God, I'm diligent, I'm faithful, I'm doing all I know how to do. Why does it seem like I'm suffering or I'm having a hard time in this area. And God is saying, I, I gotta take you this way. And you know already down in your heart, you already know in your spirit that God has already called you to be victorious. Come on, somebody. He's called you to be set aside, set apart. He's called you to be the head and not the tail. Come on, somebody. And you, you keep saying as you are moving toward it, but God, I still feel like I'm not on the right place. God said, no, stay there. Stay there because I've already told you that what, it, what I need you to do uh, is going to come. I, I'm moving you place by place, one leg at a time, to get you where you need to be. Oh, glory to God. For some of us, that, that means God is saying, I'm moving you to a special place. Some of us, that's saying, Church down. Now, it didn't shut the church down. It spread the church. Amen. 
we exalt ease and comfort. This was a have to trust God and go situation for Paul. He has to believe what the Spirit of God is directing him to do regardless of his friends. Regardless. Some of us are going to have to go back to our old stomping grounds. And God has put an anointing and a special call on your life to be able to go back and not get caught up. But when you go back to those old stomping grounds, come on somebody. Somebody's going to say, uh, I remember when you used to get high. I remember you, come on. They will, they will talk about what they remember that you used to do. And so it, it might not be the most pleasant assignment. But God, why don't you send me to a place where I can preach my heart out and get all the amen. But I, I need to tell somebody this. You can preach your heart out and not get an amen. Jeremiah prophesied and, and preached. Uh, but the Bible says that he had not one, not one. What comfort? But he had to go because he had to. He had to go and do what God called him to. Will you? Have you been there when folks uh, they're telling you not to have a procedure? Don't have the procedure. Because statistics say this, yep, and statistics say that. <laughs> They're telling you, if I was you, I wouldn't move in that neighborhood. If I was you, girl, that job, you know, they tell me, they talk about they laying off. With good intentions. But God says, I need you to go out to that job. My sister gave a testimony that's in Georgia. She was on a job, and as long as she was there, the company stayed open. The minute she left, the company closed. See, God will position you. You might be there because someone else, hey, someone else needs to have you there. And as long as you are there, the Holy Ghost that's in you is there. God is moving and working while you're there. And the minute God says, I release you to go, then the next thing you know, months later, the company closed. They were already doing bad. They were already in the red. Come on, somebody. But as long as you were there, I'm talking to myself. I'm preaching good to somebody up in here. As long as you were there, the company doors stay open. Glory to God. Don't move until you have to. Don't let somebody tell you what they wouldn't do, even in love. So now we go read a little bit more. As we look at Acts, some of y'all just coming in, we're on Acts chapter 21, and we're going to look at verses 7 through 11. The scripture says the next step, the next stop after leaving Tyre was Ptolemaeus, where we greeted the brothers and sisters and stayed for one day. The next day we went to Caesarea and stayed at the home of Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven men who had been chosen to distribute food. He had four unmarried daughters who had the gift of prophecy. Several days later, a man named Agabus, who had the gift of prophecy, arrived from Judea. He came over and took Paul's belt, bound his own feet and hands with it. Then he said, the Holy Spirit declares, so shall the owner of this belt be bound the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem and turned over to the Gentiles. So that's where we started. So verse 
28, when we go back, we don't want to skip this because it's in there and we don't want to pass this, that uh, verse 8 speaks of Philip and his daughters. Uh, it's not a key point to the narrative, but since it's mentioned, Luke thought it's important enough to mention, we're not going to skip over it. He mentions it, amen, as a matter of fact. You know, matter of fact, uh, he went by Philip, and Philip had those four daughters that prophesied. Uh, there's a couple of Philips in the scripture, so it, it, this is the deacon that was appointed to help feed the widows, and in, in particularly the Gentile widows. And so Philip has four daughters, and the Bible says that they also had the gift of prophecy. And they also statistically say, scholars say, that these four young girls were probably 16 or of age and under. And what that tells me is that you're not too young to do the will of God. And so, why does Luke include this here? And so some have suggested that uh, it was to show that uh, that he interacted with people of low status um, that, that actually had some significance in the early church. Uh, but he, oh, we also see that these four young ladies also heard from God. We have seen consistently as we started from verse 1 that there have been those who have prophesied and said don't go. And so even though the scripture does not say that these four girls prophesied to Paul, it's believed that because they had the gift that they begin to warn him, if you go to Jerusalem, there's going to be some trouble. So Paul, I'm sorry, Luke includes it in the gospel here. And so uh, as we go through, uh, we see again, how uh, they then have another prophet, Agabus, comes over. And I think about him, I think about Apostle, because she likes to demonstrate, amen? And so if you can imagine, here he is. He, he comes over to the house, and he sees Paul. And, and, and unbeknownst, he goes and he takes Paul's belt, and he begins to tie himself up. And then he says to Paul, if you go to Jerusalem, the Spirit of God said, this is what's going to happen to you. The Jewish leaders are going to bind you up. They're going to tie you up. And you won't be able to do what you think you're going to do. Sometimes in this life, we get bound up by stuff. But the scripture also said that Paul was determined to go to Jerusalem. Sometimes when life throws you hard knocks, when life uh, knocks you down and, and, and you begin to say, I, I feel like I can't do what I need to do because I'm bound, you got to have a determination. Sometimes, come on somebody, uh, sometimes you would get up and be on time for church. You would get up and make your way down to the sanctuary of God. Ah, oh, but gas is too expensive. Oh, you know what? I got a headache today. But you know what? That which might bind you. Come on, somebody. You got to have a determination yeah. in spite of it all. Get up and go. Yeah. You might be only in, in your personal affairs. God has promised I'm going to I'm going to allow you to establish your business and I'm not just going to allow you to have one Sean but I'm going to allow you to have a franchise I remember that prophetic word uh, that you would have a franchise come on somebody Ah, uh, but the enemy seemed like I'm getting fucked to open up the Compton location oh glory to God but once you get past because why you got a determination God says go because I got something for you. Some of you right now, God has ministry all in your life. But we, 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 we don't want, when, when things get hard, come on somebody. Ministry looks, it sometimes looks pretty.
pretty because I'm pretty. Sometimes it looks easy because it looks like the words of the one that's standing before you seems to come with the some ease. But there's a cost. There are times that I feel that I'm bound to stay at home. I can't go out and do like everybody else because I got a word to bring. I, I can't go and just um, and, and enjoy the, the frolicking and, and, and the merriment. Why? Because God says I need you on your face. Uh, somebody needs to understand that uh, the call that's on your life, you might not be able to do what everybody else is doing. Uh, I, you gotta go regardless if they say, come on, it's a holiday weekend. You gotta say, I still gotta go. Yes. Because I have a determination to do what God called me to do. So here in the scripture, we see the prophet warning him. And what happens here that we don't see uh, in other uh, passages, uh, when the, those who are traveling with Paul hears this prophet, they begin to say, maybe we shouldn't go. You know how it is. You got, your, you got your inner core. Jesus had his three, James, John, and, and, uh, and Peter. Peter, James, and John. Out of the 12, those were his three go-to. And, and there they are, uh, Peter, James, and John. And then, then they are in the garden. And Jesus is saying, like, couldn't you, couldn't you pray with me just for an hour? Sometimes when the, when the, when the quest to a place where it seems like it's going to get real hard sometimes even though those who are close to you love you they might not understand the calling that God has for you they don't understand the direction that God is taking and leading you in and so they might say to you wait, wait maybe, maybe we should not go to Jerusalem all this time they had not said anything, but now the prophet, he's just, he, he came and acted it out. Yeah, sure did. <laughs> and he, he said, let me, let me give you a demonstration. Sure ah. hey, let, me, let, me, let me show you what's really going to go, go down. And so those with them said, should we really go? Do you think we should go? So we see that Paul, Paul hears what they're saying and Paul says, I have to go. I have to trust God and go. I have to. And so as we go on into the scripture, we see a determined apostle. He's being warned at every house he goes and stops at. He's being told that they've seen it because God has showed them in the spirit what's going to happen. But Paul says, I also heard from God. I also know what God has spoken to me. I also know that God said for me to move and I got to move. I also know that God said go in spite of the circumstances in the situation. Go! And so when we look at verse 12, the scripture says, when we heard this, the local believers made Paul not to go. Don't go to Jerusalem. But he says, why y'all crying? Why you weeping? Why, why, are you, why are you sad? God has called me to go. Why don't you, don't get disturbed about it. He says, you, you, you're breaking my heart. Because see, we love those who are close to us. We, 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 I, you know, my mom, I know she loves me. I know she loves me. And there are times my mom will say things like, you 
see a bag and a mini bag. And it's not on my arms. But under my eyes. And it's because I know that I'm tired. But I also know God called me. And I know that this is just temporary. That my strength, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And I know, mama, you're looking at the outward appearance. I know my husband looks at the outward appearance. And sometimes I get weary and I show out. And I cut up. But I still know that even though sometimes they say you don't have to go and be at rehearsal. You don't have to be the one to blah, blah, blah. But I know what God has called me to. And even as I prepare this message, I begin to hear the voice of God. And I begin to say, God, I know you've given me a lot. And what I mean by a lot, God, he drops things into my spirit. He drops ideals into my spirit. And I write things down, uh, just like the play that y'all saw uh, uh, earlier in the spring. That was something that, that God dropped in my spirit almost five years ago. Uh, ah, but God said, now is the time. Uh, uh, it was it was ever sitting on me. Uh, glory to God. See, right now, God may have dropped something uh, in your spirit. Uh, and somebody else might be saying, I just can't see uh, how it's going to happen. Uh, ah, but you got to be like Paul. Uh, you got to say, I hear what you're saying. Uh, I understand how you feel. Uh, and you're breaking my heart because I know you care for me. Uh, but I need to tell you. still got to go. The scripture goes on and says, ah, ah, I'm all ready. He says, I am ready not only to be jailed at Jerusalem, mm. ah, but even to die for the sake of the Lord Jesus. See, a lot of us, we were, we, we were saying that until COVID hit. We were saying that uh, if I die, let me die uh, in the army of the Lord. But then COVID hit. Ah, yeah. Uh, uh, some of us say don't get too close to me. Ah, uh, because I'm not ready to contract COVID. Uh, uh, but we were the ones that were saying if I die, let me die. Uh, see, God will bring back you uh, become meant this thing. Uh, he began to say, uh, I, I gotta go uh, and I gotta be in prison. Uh, and even if it means death, uh, because I'm going uh, in the name of Jesus, uh, I got to go. Somebody say, I got to go. I got to go. Uh, I got to, I got to, I got to go. Uh, ignoring 
what God was trying to say to him? Was he not listening to the counsel of his close friends and he foolishly went to Jerusalem? And, and, and some of us, do we, do we blame Paul or do we admire him for going? And so, did he, did he get what was coming to him when he went to Jerusalem? And so, we have to err and, and, and rest on the side that because God was speaking to Paul, Paul did the right thing. And as I shared early, sometimes our family and our friends, they also hear from God. And so God is showing them that trouble is ahead. But because God is sending, nowhere, not, not one of them said that God said, don't go. They all said that if you go, there's going to be trouble. And so we have to begin to take a stand and say, I have to go. I have to trust God and go. I have to trust that when I go, that the way will be made. And I also have to trust uh, uh, that if I go and, and some things go down, I also have to trust that I know that I know that I know. Jesus. And so we see in the book of Philippians, and you don't have to turn there, but Philippians 1, 20 through 24, Paul shares this. He shares this. He says, uh, uh, give us real insight for uh, insight into the apostle's heart, uh, in which, which he shares. He says, for I fully expect it, I expect and hope that I will never be ashamed, but I will continue to be bold for Christ as I have been in the past. Paul begins to say this to the Philippians as he writes the letters, because I need you to understand, I hate to jump ahead, but this is part of the lesson. As you move through the scriptures, glory to God, you'll see that, that Paul does go to Jerusalem, and I'm not trying to get ahead, but but Paul begins, uh, he, he, he is jailed, he is in prison, uh, and the Bible says that he is in prison for two long years. Uh, but come on, somebody, sometimes you do your best work, come on, somebody, when you can't get out and run around. Uh, uh, why he was in prison. Uh, let me tell you about the favor of God. Uh, uh, Paul had his own house. He was not in the prison. Come on, somebody. He was in prison, uh, but they allowed him to have his own place. Uh, uh, he couldn't go and come like he wanted to. Uh, glory to God. Uh, but God allowed the favor on Paul's life, uh, so he had his own place. Uh, and people could come visit Paul. Uh, Paul could send letters. Uh, Paul begin to write letters to the Philippians. Uh, uh, Paul begin to write letters to, uh, to the Ephesians. Uh, uh, Paul begin to send out uh, his epistles. And he says to the Philippians, he says, and I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ whether I live or die. For to me, living means living for Christ. Dying is even better. Come on, somebody. Dying is even better. But if I can live, I can do more of fruitful work for Christ. So I really don't know which is better. I'm torn between two desires. I long to go to be with Christ, which is far better for me. But for your sakes, it's better for me that I continue to live. If it means Know, I had to go. I 
had to go. He sends them this letter. He, I had to go. How do we know when to listen to wise counsel and, and when to forge on despite what they might think? How do we know? Let me tell you one of the reasons how, how we can know. We can know because if you know the voice of God, if we know the voice of God, God is directing you. It doesn't matter what someone else say. When we know the voice of God, we will follow God's voice. The scripture says, my sheep, they know my voice. See, I know my husband's voice. He can call me amongst other people calling me, but I recognize his voice. Why do you recognize his voice? Well, I've been married to him for almost 32 years. And I've gotten accustomed to hearing his voice. I've gotten accustomed to knowing what he smells like. I've gotten accustomed to understanding some of his habits. And when we know Jesus, and we've known him for some time, we ought to know his voice. We ought to know what it smells like. We ought to know when he's calling us. We ought to know when he's telling us to go and when he's telling us to stop. Do you know Christ on today? Do you know him? I'm almost done. Do you know him? And so we 
with determination, Paul said, I got to go. <laughs> I got to go. Paul said, I got to be obedient to what God is calling me to do. I love you, my friends and my family, but I got to be obedient. I, I know that you want me to come and chill out with you, but I can't today because it's prayer this morning, and I got to be obedient. I, I, I know you want me to come and go with you to the concert, but I can't right now because God says I got to be obedient and I got to go. I don't know what it is for you. But right now, is it, are you in a place where you have to trust God and go? Have to trust God and go. When Paul gets to Jerusalem, those Jerusalem leaders, those apostles, because if many of y'all know, they had a disagreement. But they, they, made, they, made, they made up well enough so that they could be cordial to one another. And here comes Paul saying, I got this offering to help the church. And so he's met there. If you read, continue to read the scripture for your homework, you see where he goes and they begin to say, well, maybe if you go and do this, the people will be more receptive to you. And so Paul says, no problem. I'll go do that. So he goes and he begins to do what they asked him to do. And, and, and Paul had made it to Jerusalem and that's what God was sending him to do. So now Paul, he's trying to do all he can to be in a place where him and the, 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 the Jewish Christians and, and those who he, he's a part of, which are the Gentile Christians, can work together. And though Paul, he, he's a Jewish uh, a man, amen, glory to God, they, they know Paul's reputation and they just could not receive that. How can he, uh, he says that he's with us, but he went to the Gentiles. God deliberately allowed that split so that the Gentiles could receive the word. And so now he goes down and he's, he's, he's trying to follow what they've asked him to do. That he goes down, he's doing what he feels is right. He means well, here he is in Jerusalem. And someone says, isn't that him? A believer. Isn't that him? That's, that's Paul. Isn't that Saul? Paul? Isn't that him? Somebody else said, yeah, that's him. And it began to be such a ruckus. The people start cutting up. Church folks, come on, y'all. Start cutting up. Somebody, they say they kill him. Some say stone him. Some say arrest him. They start cutting up until the Romans begin to take notice and begin to say, what's going on? There's a disturbance. So let's go see what's going on. And so now here they come and they step in. Come on, somebody. We don't need the government stepping into church stuff. But because sometimes we, we can't get along, we, we disagree, uh, now here comes the Roman government. And then they said, kill him. He's the one. He's this. And so because Paul, him being a Roman citizen, they couldn't do what they wanted to do. So now they take him and they put him under arrest. So now the prophet's uh, prophetic word and this, this uh, uh, demonstration we see now comes to pass. And now Paul's being led, led, led away bound, but still determined. See, he, he was put in chains, but still determined. He had a determination. Even in the time that he had left, he had a determination that everybody that he came into contact with would know something about Jesus. He had a determination that if they put me in jail, I'm going to be in jail and we're going to have a jailhouse rock. But somebody is going to know about Jesus. Even when they sent me to Rome uh, so that I could be tried. Uh, even when I'm on a ship that's being tossed to and fro. Uh, I'm going to let everybody know. Uh, if you just stay in the ship. Uh, uh, Jesus told me uh, everything's going to be alright. Uh, if you just stay in the 
ship. You're going to make it. Ah, glory to God, somebody say, ah, because I'm there. Hallelujah. My company has to make it. Ah, I just stay on the ship. Maybe somebody you work for ah, needs to hear they need to stay with the ship. I don't know. Ah, I don't know. Ah, I can only speak for myself. Ah, but I'm here to tell you, ah, you got to have a determination. So, Paul had a determination. He sits in prison for two years, but he writes and writes and writes and writes and people come and see him and he shares the word. He shares Jesus Christ. He shares him crucified. He shares him risen. He shares the word. In those two years, Paul gets busy. He don't just stand still and feel stuck because he's in prison, but Paul gets busy. How do you know you're really trusting God? How do you know you are really trusting God in a have to situation? A, when you move forward in his will, even though others seek to dissuade you, when you move forward, uh, knowing it is likely to cost you something significant, you'll still go. How do you know? When you move forward, uh, entrusting yourself to him because you don't know the outcome. Faith manifests its reality in obedience. When we go and God says do something and we do it, a lot of times we use that in a monetary way. Sometimes God is saying, sow a seed. And, and we were thinking, well, if I sow this, I won't have that Olive Garden money. I, I won't have that lunch on next week. But in obedience to God, you sow it anyway. Maybe God is saying you need to give it to a charity that's helping children. And you look at your, your, your wallet and you look and you hear God and, and you're in obedience you do what God called you to do and you do it anyway reality reality will manifest faith manifests in reality second question I asked earlier what do you do when the will of God involves doing something that will really cost you. What do you do? We see the answer in the life of the apostle. Paul was a man bound and determined to follow Christ at all costs. And we understand that when he says, I'm ready not only to be in prison, but to die. Are you bound and determined this morning to do what God has called you to do? Are you in a place right now where you say, I have to trust God? I have to trust God. I have to trust God. Because when I look around, it's not because of my situation is a bad one. Because obviously Paul could stay where he wanted to stay. It's not because my circumstances are dire. Because Paul, God let Paul escape stoning and all kinds of things. But it's because the Holy Ghost says I'm calling you to go. I'm calling you to a place. So you say, I have to go and trust God. I have to. Let's just lift our hands on this morning. Hallelujah. As I'm speaking, I'm, if I can get uh, Minister Sean, are you 
working with the communion. Those who are helping with communion on this morning, you know who you are. I can get you to come. And as they're coming, is that you on today? We're going to receive our offering because after communion, we don't, we don't do anything but go out. Amen. Hallelujah. So before they bring the table over, we want to receive our offering. So prepare your hearts to give. Amen. Amen. So if you are in a have-to situation, I'm sorry, I jumped. If you are in that place today, I want you to say to yourself, I got to go. I got to do what God called me to do. It could be teaching the babies. I got to. Somebody's got to help train these children up. I got to. I got to go. So before we're going to receive our offering, I'm going to pray. Father God, we thank you for the word on today, God. God, you have us, and many of us are in a position right now where we have to go and trust you. And God, we, we're there because, God, you've spoken to our hearts. You've spoken to a, our spirit. And God, we want to be obedient to you. So God, those God that are in the house on today, God, God that are saying, God, I believe I'm hearing you, God, make it clear, God. Let them hear you clearly, God. And God, let them move in obedience, God, to what you are speaking to them. God, you might be speaking for them to help in a place in ministry. You might be speaking for them, God, to stay on a job, God, that seems like they need to jump out of. Because there's someone there, God, that's going to be needing a witness. God, whatever the situation, God, God, help us, God, to be obedient to your voice, God, and to your voice only. God, we know that there are many people in our lives that love us and they want us to do well. And so they give us advice and they share. And even, God, they might have even been shown by you that there are some things that are troubling. But, God, let us be obedient to your word to follow what you have to say. And God, even as we get ready to receive our offering on today, God, you move, God, in a place of obedience. God, those who are tithing, God, to, to sustain your house, God, they are moving in a place of obedience because your word has said to give, God, that your house might be sustained. Ah! There's a blessing. There's a word that's spoken, God, that you would, you would move, God, any, any tarnish that the canker worms, oh God, anything, God, that came to eat up, God, that because of the tithing, God, you would ban them, God, from our lives. And God, that we have the cheerful givers, God. You said to give cheerfully. Oh God, in the name of Jesus, give because you're happy that the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior. And you give because you know that he's going to give it back to you. Greater than you can imagine or ever give back to him. So God bless your givers on today. Bless the giving in the name of Jesus. Amen. So we're preparing to receive our offering. And then we're going to get ready to receive the Lord's Supper.
people here on today, God, we thank you for everything you taught on, God, we thank you for those who gave online, God, who gave in the house of God, so ask that you would meet every need and make every way, God, we don't lack any good thing, Lord, we just bless you and praise you, God, in Jesus' name, amen. Of that cup. 
For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and some sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But we, but when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that he could not, that he come not together until condemnation. And the rest I will set in order when I come. Amen. We're all going to stand. Those joining at home, you have your communion ready. Please prepare that. goes around to those who are ministering. Amen. We remember that Jesus he, he came and he, he was the Lamb of God. He was crucified and he rose again for us. And because of that we can be heirs and joint heirs with Christ. And so as we get ready to partake in this the Bible tells us to remember this. Not remember his birthday, but remember that he died and rose for us. And so we remember him on today that he has taken our sin. Amen. And if there's anyone, I don't want to be forgetful of this, who doesn't know the Lord. As I look around, I see familiar faces, but it doesn't mean that you're not in the place that you backslid or that you truly don't know the Lord. If you want to know him, we want to make sure we invite him into your life. Is there anyone today? Amen. All right, we're getting ready to um, come around. We're going to start with the side here closest to the wall, followed by the middle section, and then the, the end. Just come on up the center.
says, for I have received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus Christ on the same night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given it, given thanks. God, we thank you, Lord, for this communion service. God, we thank you for the bread and we thank you for the fruit of the vine. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Hold on, not yet. After the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this is the cup of the new of the new covenant, my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread, please eat your bread. And drink of the cup. Drink. You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for the blood. We thank you for your for coming for us, God. We thank you, Lord, for just allowing us, Lord, to be here on today, God, to be one of yours. And God, as we go out praising God. God, we just want you to know that we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. And they went out singing songs.